Governor Bruce Rauner unveiled his turnaround plan for the state. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Good evening, and thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Capitol View, the show where we talk about Illinois politics and government. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn, with Illinois Issues Magazine, and with me today is Charlie Wheeler, Director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at UIS. Charlie, glad you're here. Thank you, Jamie. It's always nice to be here. And Hannah Meisel with WILL Public Radio. Hannah, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. So Governor Rauner is making the rounds in Illinois once again um, to roll out his turnaround agenda for the state. He has put some of his sort of big ideas into a more concrete plan and he is shopping it around the state trying to get support for it. Charlie, what do we see coming out of this plan? A lot of these things were things the governor at least touched on when he was running for office. What kind of nuts and bolts are we getting from the governor's plan? I, I would say until we actually see the legislation we don't have anything much more than talking points. Uh, his dog and pony show that he's trotting around all over the state is kind of a uh, repeat of what he said in his state of the state message. And it basically boils down to we got to make the state more friendly to business. And one of the ways we do that is to uh, trample down organized labor so that businesses can pay people less and make more money and then they'll come and locate in Illinois. That's kind of the bottom line and he's trying to get local governments at the county level and at the city level to adopt this uh, resolution, I guess you would call it, urging the legislature to go along with the governor. So, I mean, it's, he gets a chance to see Illinois in, in April and uh, in between the rain, it's beautiful out there, so I hope he's having fun. Of course, the governor would frame his right to work zone empowerment agenda as um, letting workers make the decision as to whether or not they want to be unionized. Hannah, how are local governments uh, responding to this? We have seen some that are voicing support. Right, we've seen a couple. Um, most notably, the biggest catch that Rauner has gotten so far is McHenry County um, approving, you know, it's, it's a resolution. We have to keep that in mind. It's just a resolution. Um, so it doesn't really have any teeth to it. But, you know, some um, are reacting, you know, warmly. They say that they want to, you know, at least have a discussion about it. And then some, you know, in more urban areas, they are not reacting uh, well at all. Where I'm uh, based in Champaign, um, the mayor there has been very, very vocal about not wanting any sort of right to work, no sort of rounder agenda and, um, you know, the conversation there is hostile where, you know, other places where uh, they do think that the cost of labor, the cost of construction is very high, you know, they are a little bit more warm, but we're, we're not going to see any sort of broad, you know, state, a whole state, um, you know, doing this. And that's not what the governor wanted in the first place. Well, I think what the governor does want, though, is for the General Assembly to adopt all of these ideas he has. And as I say, I've not yet seen the specific legislation. Um, I haven't checked to see if anything was introduced uh, earlier today, so I don't know. But until you actually look at what the language of the bill is, you really are kind of in the dark trying to uh, make sense out of an idea that is more a campaign talking point than it is a specific spelled out plan of action, if you will. But Charlie, I'd like to get your thoughts on, you know, the governor has talked about a property tax freeze. This is something you know a lot about as far as how the local property tax and school funding works. I and, pay it anyway. And, uh, so what are your thoughts? Do you think he's given more of a flushed out plan? What's your reaction to in well, particular what, what he said that? on the property taxes is he wants to freeze the levy, the amount of money that uh, local government units can ask for and freeze it at current levels and not let them ask for anything more unless the voters within that district approve it at a referendum. Now, the property tax is a lot more complicated than that. And there are certain things that under the law, local governments are allowed to levy for, even if there are limits in place. For example, if there's a huge legal judgment against the local government, they have the authority to ask their voters for however much money it takes to be able to pay off that judgment. And if you look at freezing taxes where they are, 
at the one hand, he's telling local governments, he's telling counties, cities, uh, school districts, large chunk of the property tax, something like 60% goes to school districts. He's telling them, you can't ask for more money in the future. At the same time, he's telling cities and counties, oh, by the way, the money that is your share of the state's income tax under deals and legislation that go back to the introduction of the tax in 1969, we're going to take away some of that money too. So we're going to take away the money that you're entitled to by law from the income tax, and we're also going to make it impossible for you to raise property taxes. So the question is, where does he think local governments are going to get the money to pay for the costs of the goods and services, not expanding programs, but just paying for what they do now as inflation causes those costs to go up? April and May is the time that a lot of school districts start uh, formulating their budget for the new year. And um, you know, right now with the promise or <laughs> uh, threat, however way you want to look at it, of a property tax freeze hanging over their heads, uh, combined with what you were saying, Charlie, about um, a freeze in the local government distributive fund, you know, they are kind of in a lurch and they, you know, they have to budget for the next year and they don't know what's coming. You know, if, if, the, if the state even is allowed to, you know, freeze property taxes, which is kind of up for debate also, um, you know, schools will have kind of no option because they might not get much more money from the state, even with yeah. Ga Rauner uh, promising $300 million more next year in school funding. And uh, that kind of leaves Rauner in an interesting place too, because he campaigned as the education governor. He, before he got famous for, uh, you know, running for governor, he was famous in philanthropy circles for, you know, his work in education. So it leaves everyone in a weird place. Well, the state could go ahead because um, basically local governments are creatures of the state. They can only do, with some exception for home rule units, what the statutes authorize them to do. And if the General Assembly and governor chose to, they could tell local governments, yeah, you can't ask for any more money. As a matter of fact, back in, I believe it was 91, we passed the property tax extension limitation law, the so-called tax caps. That imposed limitations on the ability of local governments to raise their levy, the amount they ask for from year to year, to the lesser of inflation or 5%. Now, it's never been 5%, and the last couple of years has been very low. There are certain exceptions, again, for uh, lawsuit judgments, that kind of thing, but it's basically held property taxes in check. One other piece of this plan, Charlie, that I wanted to get your thoughts on was the proposal for workers' compensation reform. I, I know you've seen various iterations over the years trying to bring down the cost of workers' compensation insurance in the state. What were your thoughts on what Rauner is proposing? Well, I think what he suggested makes sense, and I think of all the things he's talked about, that's the one area that is most likely to see some fruit. And basically the problem is the way the system e exists now, and, and basically workers' compensation is a program that says if I'm injured on the job, I don't have to sue you, my employer, I can file a claim, and the statute sets out uh, basically the the provisions for my medical care being taken care of, my lost wages being reimbursed, um, and if I lose a finger, it's worth so much, if I lose an eye, it's worth so much, and so on, and so we don't have to go to court. The difficulty is that what defines a workplace-related injury is much broader than what the business community wants. So if, uh, if I'm working in a factory and I um, you know, and, and, and a crane topples on me, that's clearly a workplace injury. On the other hand, if I'm driving home from the company softball game and I'm in an accident, is that workplace, re, uh, workplace related? So the, the business community would like to see a clear standard saying that the, the cause of the injury has to be more than half related to what you do at work. So Which might be an issue with, like, say, a repetitive stress injury, yeah, so if like I have carpal, carpal tunnel. tunnel, because I type at my computer and I've been doing it for 20 years for the U of I, can I sue the U of, or file workers' comp against the U of, I, U of I and have them responsible for the repetitive stress that goes back to the time, like 40, 50 years ago, that I started on a typewriter for the Sun Times? <laughs> And so the plan that Renner has proposed would not toss out the state's no-fault system. It would just change the way that injuries yeah, are evaluated? Change the standards. 
also require, um, for want of a better term, require injured workers to go to doctors that the, that the employer approves instead of having the uh, injured person get to choose their own doctor and see only that doctor. It would reduce the reimbursements that are paid to doctors who handle work and co workers' compensation cases. And there's some other changes in there. These are things the business community has uh, sought for a long time. And in the discussions I've had with business leaders, they are much more concerned, I believe, about workers' compensation than they are about things like the uh, corporate income tax. So as Rauner was shopping his uh, turnaround agenda to various editorial boards, he made some controversial comments about the state's judiciary and the Illinois Supreme Court in particular. Hannah, can you fill us in about what the governor had to say? Right. Uh, governor Rauner was talking the other day to the Daily Herald editorial board, and he said you know, that the Supreme Court was part of a corrupt system and that they were activist judges who want to be legislators. And this is in, uh, you know, he says he also uh, doesn't trust the Illinois Supreme Court. And this is, again, in response to, you know, what is going on with the pension law that is currently debated, being debated in the Illinois Supreme Court. We had oral arguments about a month ago, and, you know, we don't know when the final ruling will come out. But the governor has, um, you know, said that no matter what the Supreme Court says, he wants to go ahead actually with his own um, plan for pensions, which would be to put all workers into this tier two system that was approved a couple of years back. And, um, you know, it's gotten, uh, you know, legal groups all up in arms. They are very, very upset. Yeah, it's definitely caused a stir, especially among those who have been watching the State House and the Supreme Court for years. Charlie, what did you think of the, gover uh, of the governor's statement? I thought it was ill advised for. Uh, a member of one branch of government to paint with a broad brush that everybody in another branch is corrupt. Uh, I also thought it was pretty ill-informed. Uh, the governor referred to us as having these activist judges. Well, anybody who's followed the Supreme Court, who's read their opinions over the year, the last, last thing in the world you would accuse the Illinois Supreme Court of being is activist. Even when they had the opportunity to do so, there was a famous case some years back where the states system of financing schools was challenged. And the court said, no, uh, we're going to uphold it. We're going to, you know, up uphold the decision that dismissed the suit. But then in kind of a, a note at the end, they said, this doesn't mean that we like this system. And they said, in essence, this system is horrible. But it's not our job. It's for the legislature to fix. So I don't think it's an activist court at all. And kind of the irony is when the court threw out his term limits uh, petitions last year, he criticized the court for not listening to the will of the people. And I'm thinking to myself, how does that jibe? If, if you're saying the court should have listened to the will of the people instead of the precedent and the law, aren't you asking them to be activist and now you're complaining about them? So I thought it was really ill-advised, but you know, he's, he's still new at the job, he's still learning, maybe he hasn't realized yet that the Supreme Court is an equal branch of government, although they had the courtesy to invite him over to, to see them in session so he might get a clue, uh, you know, maybe he'll catch on. He did kind of circle back and say that he was talking about uh, the ju judiciary as a whole and concerns about conflict of interest because judges are elected and they take campaign money. Charlie, there is a lot of criticism about the way that judges are um, you know, elected in the state. Is there some kernel of truth beneath this, as you said, maybe ill-informed uh, terror that the governor is going on? Yeah, the, the, the difficulty, if you want to look at it that way, is that we do elect judges. And that was a decision that was made at the time of the new constitution being ratified. The voters of Illinois decided that they wanted to keep electing their judges. And particularly in recent years, after the U.S. Supreme Court ruling that kind of opened the doors for dark money, there's been a lot of money put into judicial races at the Supreme Court level all around the country in an effort to elect judges whose thinking mirrors the people who are making the donations. And in Illinois, the, the, the governor talks about the trial lawyers. Well, in Illinois, there's a history of people on both sides of the so-called uh, tort reform, changing the civil justice system, putting huge amounts of money to try and elect people or keep them on the Supreme Court. The latest victim, if you will, was Justice Lo Lloyd Carmeier, 
there was a multi, well not multi-million, but more than a million dollar effort mounted last November to deny him retention. Uh, Carmeier won his seat 10 years previously in what at the time was the costliest judicial election in the United States of America. He and his Democratic opponents spent in the neighborhood of nine plus million dollars kind of evenly divided. And Carmeier had money from the business interests, a big chunk of it from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, his opponent, Gordon Magg, had a bunch of money from the trial lawyers and the Democrats. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing problem. Uh, four years earlier, Tom Kilbride, who is a Democrat justice from the Quad Cities area, had to spend a ton of money to beat back uh, an attempt to have him denied retention and, and some of the people who were fighting against Kilbride were the same people who were fighting to keep Carmeier. So if you're gonna elect judges, that's a problem. Maybe one of the ways around it is to say, we will publicly finance Supreme Court elections. Uh, there was legislation, in fact, years ago, one of the co-sponsors was then Senator Barack Obama to create a system of public financing for judicial elections at the appellate level, the appellate court or the Supreme Court. Uh, it didn't go anywhere. Um, so the, the only way that you could get all of this so-called conflict of interest removed is if you went to appointed judges, but then that raises the question, who does the appointing, how do people get on the short list, and what kind of conflicts do they bring with them? So it's, it's not an easy situation to resolve. That said, I don't think it's fair to say that the judges are a, a part of this corrupt system and to impugn their integrity. Because over the years, one thing that I've concluded about the Supreme Court is that it is pretty darn independent and its allegiance is to the Constitution and the laws, not to any political party or not to any outside group. Well, the governor has been making lots of news over the past few days, perhaps because the legislature is on break um, last week and this week as well. Um, the governor took some budget action on Friday that also caused quite a bit of controversy. Hannah, can you tell us a little bit about what the governor did? The governor um, froze a lot of grants. Um, these are grants that uh, specific programs apply to the state to get, and uh, the governor froze them. Um, some of the uh, things on his chopping block were things that he had mentioned in his budget address that he wants to either uh, completely defund or drastically reduce their funding. So maybe it's not quite a sh as a, a shock, uh, the programs that he targeted, but you know, all of a sudden they don't have the money. So $1 million um, of that funding was for the Autism Project. It's a project that uh, is um, based out of the University of Illinois and um, it helps uh, parents and uh, children with autism connect with the resources that they might not have known that are available, that you know, it helps them get extra help, some tutoring, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, things like that. And he actually announced that on World Autism Day, which put a lot of people, you know, really ruffle a lot of feathers. Yeah, and to be clear, this uh, came down actually Friday of last week, Good Friday, which was also w World Autism yes. Awareness Day. Um, another $3 million um, was for immigrant integration programs, um, you know, helping uh, immigrants, you know, get things that they need, uh, licenses, uh, legal help, um, uh, other things like that, con connecting them to services that they might not know are available to them. Um, another was $7 million in funeral and burial cost assistance uh, for people who, you know, already are, uh, they have you know, help from the state, from the federal government, um, another 300,000 assistance for homeless and 800,000 in HIV and AIDS programs. And this uh, freezing of grants, it was only about $26 million, which Charlie in the overall state budget is kind of a pittance, but the programs that this fund, that these grants fund do a lot with this, these small amounts of money, don't they? Yeah, and, and, and for example, um, Hannah mentioned the indigent burial program. Uh, the fact of the matter is that people who are desperately poor, receiving public aid, do pass away. And when they pass away, their remains are there. Now, should we uh, throw them in a big pile and burn them? Or should we give them a, a decent, humane burial? The state, for as long as I've been following this, has always appropriated money so that when indigent folks pass away, they can have a, a decent burial. 
and funeral homes uh, around the state rely on this. And some of them are run by Republicans, some of them are run by Democrats. And so what the state is saying is, no, we're not going to do that. And so uh, the, the, the bodies of folks who passed away are going to be piled up, to use a crude term, and there's not going to be any resolution of how do we handle this. So it's, it's just short-sighted. But, but to me, the, the bigger issue with what Rauner did is that House Speaker Michael Madigan was on the floor and presenting this agreement purportedly between the administration and the legislature to solve the budget crunch that we're facing in the current fiscal year. It involved taking a lot of money from other funds and reallocating certain dollars, uh, roughly two and a half percent across the board cut for most programs, except for a handful, including ones, as Hannah mentioned, the Autism Project, some other money for developmentally disabled services, and Madigan represented to the House members urging passage of this bill that these very important human service programs were going to be spared, they were going to be protected. And so now the governor turns around and cuts them. And so I'm thinking to myself, is he really that, um, what's the right word, out of it that he doesn't realize that it's probably not a good idea to double cross the Speaker of the House? And I look back at, at history. Rod Blagojevich, his first term or his first year in office, his first budget, he asked for a lot of stuff and the General Assembly gave it to him, including unprecedented ability to swipe money from these funds. Uh, come the fall, or actually before the fall, come the, the time for the budget to be signed into law, Blagojevich made certain cuts. And he had represented to the state elected officials the cuts would be at one level. And he cut more deeply after giving them his word. And I remember when uh, my class that year went in for a news conference with Jesse White, the Secretary of State, somebody asked Jesse White, what do you think of the new governor? And Jesse White says, he's a liar. And I about, uh, well, I was totally flabbergasted. <laughs> Jesse White is a, is a very courteous, old school type gentleman. He rarely says a harsh word about anybody. And for him to call the governor a liar, but Bogoyevich had told him one thing and they did something else. And the next year when it came time to do the budget, Blagojevich had the, what I consider the humiliation of having to sign written statements, memoranda of understanding that in essence said, I gave you my word and now I'll put it in writing because you can't trust me. So it, I think it was just a really a dumb move on Rauner's part to double cross Madigan. And if it's a question of he said, she said, uh, I would trust Michael Madigan before I would trust Bruce Rauner because Rauner showed on the campaign trail that the truth is, kind of wishy-washy. When it suits his convenience, he'll be honest. When it doesn't, he won't. It seems surprising given that, you know, this deal took a while, there were a lot of eyes on it, and folks were s sort of looking at it uh, to see what the, the broader bu budget negotiations might go like, saying if this goes well, then maybe it means that the leaders and the governor can work together. And now that all seems to be shot, Charlie. I mean, ha ha will it come to to yeah, memorandums I mean, of understanding, that's something, you know, I we're all wondering. I wouldn't be surprised, but from all the years that I've, I've watched state government, people double-crossing Michael Madigan usually don't come out ahead for it. And it's not just Madigan, it's for state government to work, you have to have trust. You have to have trust among the leadership. You have to be able to go in and we're negotiating and you're on one side, I'm on the other, and I say, I'll give you half a loaf, and you say, I'll give a half a loaf to me, and then we say, okay, that's the deal. But if I can't trust you to follow through, why am I ever gonna be compelled or, f or feel safe enacting a deal? Uh, one of the things about George Ryan and that made him successful as a governor in terms of running the state was the fact that his word was his bond. And if George said to a legislator, you vote for this uh, gas tax increase or license plate fee, and we'll make sure that road gets fixed. The legislature knew that that would, or the, the lawmaker knew that that would happen. Uh, and I think 
Rauner has yet to establish that level of trust and credibility. And just having a, a $20 million slush fund on the, on the side to threaten people with if they don't go along with you, I don't think that's enough to get the job done. We're seeing the governor, uh, you know, since he was sworn into office, we've seen him do things that require no work of the legislature, uh, except with the exception of that uh, budget fix that we saw a couple weeks ago now. Um, but he has ruled by executive order and, um, you know, this grant freezing, uh, that has been, you know, just him too. And so we're seeing him kind of govern the way that he was used to running a business. And so there's been questions, um, you know, since he began running for governor, will he, you know, does he know how state government works? Does he acknowledge how slow it can be? Um, you know, apparently yes, and he is going, you know, along with the way that he is used to things being. Now that, um, that flies with some voters who, you know, trust it. He, they said, I'm voting for Rauner because I know that he can go in there and stand up to, you know, Michael Madigan and, you know, run the state like a business like we want and, you know, clean up Springfield. Um, but then, you know, that, that wins points for the short term, but for the long term, it's not going to be a very pretty road for the uh, state budget for next year because we haven't even really gotten there yet. That's yeah. true, and Charlie, we only have maybe about 30 seconds left, but there is a lot to get done when lawmakers return next week. Do you think we will see session go into the summer? I think, uh, at least from the governor's comments, yeah, he's looking forward to being here in July. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Well, I guess we'll be seeing you all again then. I'd like to thank my guests, Charlie we Wheeler and Hannah Meisel, and I'm your host, Jamie Dunn with Illinois Issues Magazine, and please, please tune in next week for Capital View.